who's who Florida birds. As Lara mentioned, these webinars are recorded and you can go back and view some of the previous uh, presentations. And backyard bird habitat has been covered. Shannon did a great job on Florida owls and Lara presented on small but significant songbirds. So that um, allowed me to kind of narrow down what we were gonna bring you today. And I thought we would focus on those birds that are easily seen uh, without special equipment, um, even from the car, if uh, you happen to not be such an outdoor person, you can still appreciate nature. Um, the, the water birds, the wading birds, the big birds that you can see uh, associated with bodies of water, both marine and fresh water. Now here's our first raise your hand. Uh, this is our first question. Raise your hand, find that raise your hand button, and raise your hand if you know what this is. And I'll give you all a second, a couple of seconds to do that. And just wanted to say uh, thank you to Carl and Kathleen Nichter, who are volunteers here at Brooker Creek Preserve, who are also uh, professional photographers for allowing us to use their images today. So I hope we got a lot of people raising their hands. I hope you all, I hope you all know that this is the roseate spoonbill, Platalia ayaya. And the roseate spoonbill is that big pink bird that when people outside the state come to see us, they're thinking that it's they're seeing a flamingo. The spoonbill's distribution is very sparse in Florida. Uh, they only nest in a couple of areas. Pinellas County has a very, very uh, successful nesting population uh, throughout certain areas of the Caribbean and along the Gulf Coasts and the Pacific Coast of Mexico down into South America. So very limited in the United States in their distribution. There are six spoonbills found worldwide, but only one here in the quote unquote new world. And it's the only one uh, with this brilliant plumage and also setting it apart, it's the only bald headed one. Now, these birds were nearly wiped out in the late 19th century. And see if you know why, see if, see if you know what threats a lot of our waiting birds were put under uh, during the later part of the 19th, 18th century, my mistake, 18th century. Was it habitat destruction? Was it the exotic pet trade? Was it exposure to toxic chemicals or was it the plume hunters? Go ahead and vote. There's just one answer, well, one and a half. Um, but the primary cause for their decline at the end of the 19th century was, and as soon as, okay, Lara's plume hunters, 81%, you're right. Uh, habitat destruction, we would accept as a, a, as a uh, acceptable, uh, maybe a B minus answer, but the plume, in, the plume hunters were what really decimated uh, the populations of not just the roseate spoonbill, but other, other wading birds as well. And in Florida, it is still, despite the fact that it is rebound and we have three successful breeding colonies, it is still a species of special concern. So we're keeping our eye on it and making sure that we have plenty of preserve land set aside for not just the roseate spoonbills, but others. The spoonbill is this kind of flattened, rounded, very awkward looking structure. Uh, but if you can see, they're not, they don't quite meet the, the, the top bit overlaps the underside and their bill is very highly innervated. It's got lots and lots of uh, very sensitive nerve endings and it sweeps its head back and forth. And when, um, when it detects food, which includes fish and aquatic invertebrates, uh, it automatically snaps shut. So it, it's almost like um, it, it, it feels almost before it, it snaps shut, it kind of does it itself. So, and because of the fact that they eat aquatic invertebrates like shrimp and crayfish and things like that, it also helps them get their color. They get their color from their food, as you might be aware, the flamingo does as well. We do not have flamingo native in Florida. Some have, have escaped from collections and you might see one here and there, uh, but we do not have resident populations of flamingos, though they can be found throughout the Caribbean. So now we'll take a look at some of the easier species to identify, the rosette spoonbill probably being uh, on top uh, as far as 
what the lay person might know, the herons and egrets um, are basically the, the, in the same family. There's not really a difference between a heron and an egret, uh, but we'll, we'll touch on, on what might be considered a difference in just a moment. The great blue heron is, just as it says, it's large and it's kind of a slaty blue color. And the great blue heron is distinguished by uh, its presence. Uh, it's definitely its size. Um, it's everywhere. So our friends from throughout North America uh, might recognize this bird if they uh, came down here to Florida. And with that gigantic beak, it'll eat just about anything it can catch, uh, even something as large as a chicken. I'm not making that up. Here you can see the distribution. So it is a very familiar bird, even though um, uh, for visitors to Florida, they probably already recognize this one it's, uh, from back home. That distinctive, very heavy dagger-like bill, it has a crest, uh, it can raise these two feathers behind in a threat display, and that overall blue-gray color are good ways to recognize the great blue heron. Herons, great blues, tend to nest in very, very large colonies. Uh, that's usually, uh, the, the location for the colony is usually um, in, um, due to the uh, presence or absence of a, a large number of predation predators, which would include raccoons, opossum, um, feral cats, um, coyote, that sort of thing. So where it's nice and safe, uh, they'll build their colonies. And they start to form their pair bonds in the spring. And what you see here is the construction of a nest. And this very action helps to uh, solidify the bond between these, these two individuals. Uh, very difficult to tell male and female apart unless you actually see one laying an egg. It's a good chance that one's the female. Another large wading bird, our second largest wader, is the great egret or the American egret. And here it is uh, doing a breeding display that's unique to this egret with its head back and these special feathers erected and this bright green coloration around the eye and nostrils called the lure. As I mentioned before, egrets and herons are in the same family, but uh, those it, within the family that have these special plumes called aigrettes, um, those were the valuable plumes that led to the population decimation of these particular, especially these particular birds. And they will nest in colonies with other species. So uh, if the hunters were going after one species within a, a, a rookery, um, the other birds might have been chased off the nest and their nest would then fail. So um, unfortunately, nesting in numbers to avoid natural predators uh, was a, a deleterious uh, when it came to these uh, plume hunters. As you can see, this elaborate courtship display and they are found all over the world. So note uh, for the great egret or the American egret, that bright yellow bill. This green, we call it makeup, uh, is seasonal. Uh, the males and females both have the skin around their eye and nostril called the lure. As I mentioned before, it turns bright green. There's no crest. You can see this bird has erected its head feathers, but there's no uh, long bit sticking up like would be the case in the great blue. And you'll find them everywhere. You'll even find them uh, in urban and suburban um, situations, hunting through shrubbery for lizards, snakes, and other upland species. Not particular when it comes to diet. Now this little one, this little white egret, is the snowy egret. And a couple of points to make about the snowy egret uh, that helps in identification is that it's not a baby great egret. Uh, some people often see these uh, feeding together and, oh, look at the mama and the baby. And no, no, they're, they're just after different foods, hanging out together. The way to uh, identify this little egret uh, are the yellow feet. And if you can't see the yellow, bright yellow feet, look for the almost solid black bill. And they have lots of extra aigrettes, both on the, on the crown, on the breast, and on the back as well. So they're very fluffy. And you mostly see them uh, in uh, marine systems, and they're about, like it says, about the size of a duck. So not a huge egret like the previous species we just saw. And again, if you have the opportunity to see the feet, 
uh, when it's flying or just walking around, uh, look for those yellow feet. Um, some people like to draw a line between the snowy egret with yellow feet to don't eat yellow snow. So you've got yellow and snow in the same little mnemonic. So those are the easy ones. Let's do a quick uh, review. We'll do a multiple choice review for the, for the species that we just looked at. So uh, we'll go ahead and advance the slide and you'll have a, a poll question launched in just a second here and uh, go ahead and make a selection as soon as you recognize what A might be, what B, what C, and what D. And take a look at some of these field markings that we mentioned before. Bills, feet, head plumes, crests, things like that. Choose carefully. And I'll have to admit, I do not have a degree in ornithology, but I love uh, nature, obviously, and watching birds has become a hobby of mine. And um, just every day is a, is a learning day, learn a new something about a, a particular organism, bird, plant, animal, anything. Um, there are a lot of great resources out there. If you're not familiar with, I would definitely get familiar with the Florida's fabulous series of books. Lots of great information there. And of course, from your local extension office or the University of Florida IFAS extension. All right, so I guess it's about time to wrap this up. Let's see how we did. Number one, great blue heron, very good. Number two, or B, uh, that would be the great egret or the American egret, well done. And number three, the snowy egret, very good. And number four, is the roseate spoonbill. So give yourselves a hand. Good job on those. Now we'll do the more difficult to quickly recognize, and it takes a little bit of repetition and further exposure uh, to the next couple of species, um, but we'll give you some tips on how to identify them. Now this is the reddish egret, not radish, but reddish. And it has these, uh, this kind of uh, auburn colored neck and oftentimes that extends down into the back as well. Um, it is a true egretta, so it's the reddish egret. What you want to look for in identifying this uh, is this two-toned bill uh, with pink being the basal color with a black tip. So pink is close to red, pink, reddish. Um, the crest, it like the great blue has a crest, but the great blue, if you'll recall, has a solid yellow beak. Um, it's slaty color on its back and belly could, and its large size could lead to misidentifying it as a great blue. Uh, but what really sets it apart is if you can see it do its fancy dance. Again, it's not very common. We do not see many of these. Uh, not only are they not colonial in, in habit, they don't feed together, but they're also not found in very many places. They hug the coast of the, of the Gulf and down into South America and throughout uh, the Caribbean as well. You can look for blue legs on this species and they eat fish. Uh, this is an individual that is hunting. It's throwing its wings up over its head to startle fish, which it can then uh, shoot that dagger right into the water um, and catch the fish. It dances around, it kicks, at the fi it kicks them up and it waves its arms. And, and that's the fancy dance that I was telling you about earlier or mentioned earlier. It's really because it's so infrequent, it's not very well studied. So in that, we, we don't know much about its um, uh, uh, habits and its behaviors, except for, you know, when you see one jumping around in the surf, you pretty much recognize that one. Also, the reddish egret is dimorphic, which means there's a white form. And I'm sorry about that. It's not my fault. It's just 
the way it is. There's a white reddish egret and it's still called the reddish egret. And it can very easily be mistaken for a great egret, uh, the American egret, which is also white with the black or bluish legs. Uh, but again, what you wanna look for is the, uh, that pink base to the beak and the black tip. That's the reddish egret. A small egret heron is the little blue and it's so named because it's little and it's blue. Pretty clever. It's uh, this slaty, again, slaty uh, blue-gray overall, and it too has a bicolored bill like the reddish secret, but it's um, only half the size. It's small. You can see here uh, in the reeds, it's, it's not that big of a bird. Um, it survived the plume trade. It didn't really have that much to offer, um, and the fact that it is more secretive. It doesn't have, it doesn't necessarily uh, spend time in, in large, large communities. Again, that bicolored bill, uh, this, the base color is blue. So blue bill, little blue. Unfortunately, again, it's not my fault. The juvenile is white, but it still has that bicolored bill that's blue to start. And as juveniles, they are the same size as the adults. Um, uh, nestlings get to be full sized, but they have different plumage in many of these species. Um, then it goes from this white phase into a mottled phase where it's kind of checkered. It's called a harlequin at that point. And then it eventually molts into the all blue phase of the little blue heron. Now here's a question. Is this a great egret or the white morph of the reddish egret? We'll give you a second to answer this question. Is it the great egret? Is it the American egret? Or is it the white morph of the reddish egret? Which, for those of you in Pinellas County, there's a resident, oop, I'm not gonna say the answer, but there's a resident one of these at the Fort DeSoto Park, County Park. Probably just gave it away, can't wait to see the answers. Fingers crossed. Ta-da, you're right. That is the white morph of the reddish egret. And again, we're looking right there at those pink lips. Well done. The tricolored heron could be mistaken for a little blue. Uh, it is, again, I keep saying slaty blue, but it's just the color of some of these birds. It's, um, it's got that overall color. But what you want to look for, uh, we'll point out in just a second, uh, this is a, a bird that might not be familiar to our guests for our snowbirds. They might not recognize when as it only, it's a very uh, southern species. Um, it does have the three colors, kind of a rust color, slate and white. Sometimes it's called the Louisiana heron. Some people refer to it as that and give it that common name. Uh, it's kind of misleading because it's not just found in Louisiana. It too, um, was indirectly affected by the plume trade, as I mentioned before, because it roosts in these large rookeries. So these birds were either killed because they were in the way or just chased off their nest uh, when the raiders would come uh, to collect the birds for the plume industry. These are pretty solo. They're, they're kind of loners. You, you see one of these at a time. They don't really hang out in large groups, but uh, to spot the Louisiana, if you see a slate blue with a white belly, um, that's not going to be the little blue. So we'll move on to a group that are called the night herons. Uh, probably to be scientifically correct, we'll call them the nocturnal herons. And there's two species that we have here, uh, and they're very cleverly named. This is the yellow crowned night heron because it's got a yellow Crown. The night herons have very heavy bills. They have great big, large red eyes, and they tend to crouch. They tend to keep their neck uh, pulled down as they wait for uh, nighttime to come so they can get out and start uh, searching for their, their prey. The yellow crown night heron is a crustaceivore. And I don't know if that's a made up word or not, but it means they eat crustaceans. And we know that crustaceans are the you know, the crabs and, and crayfish, things like that. Uh, it breeds in the swamp and in wetlands, and it's got that giant head. It's really not streamlined at all. It's very top heavy, easy to recognize in profile. And here's a juvenile, 
but you see the crown is still light colored. It's still light. And that giant red eye helps them to see at nighttime. And the way that they um, feed on these crustaceans is that they smash them on the ground and break them into bits and then eat individual crab legs and then uh, the rest all together. The other night heron is the black crowned night heron. And just like it says on the label, it has a black crown. It's found throughout the world with the exception of Australia and uh, South Pole, uh, but everywhere else worldwide. Uh, they tend to hide and their black back and head uh, keeps them uh, disappeared in the shadows. Um, because they feed on, a, this species feeds on a wide range of of other species of, of fish and crayfish and things like that, um, their presence or absence can inform the health of an overall uh, wetland or another uh, habitat that they might be uh, living in. So they're referred to as bioindicators. And other of these wading birds have these ecological services in, in providing us with a with a view as to whether or not a particular habitat is healthy or not by their presence and by their presence if the numbers are particularly high or if their numbers begin to drop off quickly. Um, things might uh, be amiss that need to be um, looked after. They will tolerate disturbed habitat. So again, if something's going wrong with the population of black crowned night herons in an already disturbed habitat, uh, some, uh, it, it's indicative that something might be seriously wrong. We're going to do another quiz now for the more difficult of these species. We've got four more to choose from. Uh, a, B, C, and D. And here's your poll. It's been launched now by Lara. Thank you, Lara. Uh, and just quickly indicate what you think A is. Little blue, great blue, black crown, yellow crown. Um, and B little blue, great blue, reddish, or tricolor, as we call it, the tricolored. And number three, is that a tricolor, little blue, great blue, or great? They're all great, really, aren't they? And in D, we've got snowy, great, cattle, or ibis. And while y'all are voting, I'm going to grab a quick sip of water. All right, let's see what we got. And thank you all again today for tuning in and signing up. All right, we're gonna see what we did. Number one is the Black Crown Knight Heron, B is the reddish egret. You can see that uh, the pink base and the, the amber colored neck. C is the little blue and D is the snowy. Good job, everyone. And now a few more to finish up, a few more of our wading birds that you might find uh, at the seashore or around a lake or a retention pond. This is the wood stork, very graceful in flight. Uh, these black primaries, they're called, these black feathers that line an otherwise white body, uh, very visible from uh, even if the bird is very, very high in the sky, uh, flying with its neck outstretched and this crazy heavy curved bill. That's the wood stork. Uh, here's that white morph reddish egret. Uh, the egrets tend to tuck their neck in when they're flying. They have a special bone in their neck that's S-shaped. It's called the hyoid bone. And um, it allows them to, to shoot their neck forward to catch their prey. And they tuck, their, they tuck their head in when they're flying. So you see a big white bird flying with its neck outstretched like this, uh, probably the wood stork. Their distribution, this is another um, bird that might not be familiar to our snowbirds uh, or visitors to the state. Uh, and they're not even found throughout the whole state, just uh, kind of here and there 
uh, throughout the Caribbean, and then again along the coast of Central and into South America. It's the only stork in the New World. Its bald head allows it to keep clean as it tends to submerge its head into, into water. Its bald head and its habit of defecating on its legs uh, to keep cool uh, are two indicators. And then uh, DNA, is, uh, DNA work is actually coming in to um, finalize things. It's probably closely related to the black vulture. Um, vultures have previously been aligned with the raptors, the birds of prey, uh, because of their hooked bill, but other characteristics um, actually place them closer to the stork, or the stork closer to the, to the black vulture. That bill is super heavy and giant and almost comedy. Um, in the animal world, the snapping shut of a uh, stork's bill, uh, a wood stork's bill, is one of the fastest uh, within the whole animal kingdom, is that, that quick motion. And again, it is also tacto, tactile, <laughs> feeling around for its food. How about that? And as soon as those nerves in the bill feel something, it snaps shut. And they kind of lope through the water in great big long strides, and they tend to hunch over when they're hunting as well. Anything that moves, um, except it doesn't grab insects out of the air, uh, certainly could eat insect larvae underwater. Um, and small fish might not be worth tr uh, s triggering that snap shut. This unique water bird, wading bird, is the limpkin. It's called a limpkin because of the way that it walks around. It kind of, it looks like it might be limping. Uh, it also has a slightly down curved beak. Um, it has this very cryptic coloration, so it almost disappears in the reeds and the, the dry grasses around the edge of, of freshwater wetlands. And if you're ever in an area where Limpkin are resident, you might hear what sounds like a brutal murder taking place. They have uh, what's been described as an alarming vocal display. Uh, it's a shrieking sound, um, kind of unlike anything else. Uh, sometime, if you want to uh, guess now that it's around Halloween, go ahead and Google uh, Limpkin vocal display and see what you think. They have a very limited diet. They only eat mollusks, and in particular, apple snails, uh, clams, freshwater clams, um, and mussels as well but primarily that apple snail. We have an invasive apple snail, and if you sat in on any of our invasive species uh, webinars, I'm sure you've heard of the uh, invasive apple snail. We also have our native apple snail. The, if there can be an upside to an invasive exotic, uh, in the case of the apple snail, the, the non-native apple snail has actually been a benefit to the populations of Limpkin, and they've expanded their range as a direct result of this increased food supply. So they're kind of doing their part in, in taking care of an invasive species, but it's to their own benefit as well. And the Limpkin, unlike all the herons that were related to each other, um, are alone in their family. They're not related to anything else. They're, they're alone in the little Limpkin, the Limpkin family. And coming back to almost where we began, uh, this species is called the white ibis. Uh, they're pretty prevalent now. I grew up in Pinellas County and I don't remember seeing these very much when I was young, but now you see them everywhere along water's edge and even in the uplands. A uh, friend calls them sewing machine birds by the action of the probing, uh, the, the rapid probing into the soil, uh, often found in, in pretty large flocks. Um, Notice the very long down curved bill. It's much, uh, it's much more slender than the wood stork, uh, and it's more down curved than the limpkin. Their overall color is white, although they do have some of that black pigment uh, on their wing tips. That black pigment is actually a, a strengthening pigment that keeps the, the flight feathers from wearing out too fast. Their face, uh, they, turn, they tend to blush when it's mating season. Uh, both this area called the lore and their legs turn a bright, bright red, uh, much more pinkish and washed out the rest of the year. Um, 
they will nest in colonies of up to 30,000 pairs. So very successful um, and very ubiquitous. As I said, we're kind of coming back to the beginning because these are related to the spoonbill. And um, in captivity, uh, species of ibis and spoonbill have actually successfully mated and raised uh, a hybrid. So the young look very, very similar at a very early age between the two species, but eventually the spoonbill's bill becomes that spoon and then the ibis becomes this downturned snout. Um, Fun fact about ibis, and if you see a flock of ibis flying over with those, they're small white about the size of a chicken with the black wing tips, uh, look down. Uh, they eat a lot of crustaceans, and as such, they need to, to throw that, uh, those exoskeletons back up. That's called casting a pellet, and they can do that when they're flying. So, word to the wise, if you see a flock of ibis, just look down. So thank you very much. Uh, that's waiting birds for today. I appreciate your attention. 